Hello, I'm Karthik Ramana and I'm a professor of business and public policy here at the Blavatnik School and also the director of the Master of Public Policy program. I'm delighted to be welcoming you to this admissions event. In a moment, you will be hearing from some of my colleagues uh, on the admissions team. Uh, they are here to answer your questions. But before we go to that part of the programming, I thought I'd give you a brief introduction to the MPP program. So if there's one phrase that I think best captures what the MPP is about, it is building unlikely coalitions. The MPP program was created to convene every year somewhere around 140 individuals from across the world who are united in the mission of advancing the practice of good government. However, as you can imagine from the diversity of profiles of our MPP students, these individuals come from very different backgrounds, they have very different lived experiences, and they want and they seek very different agendas through a career in government. Part of the mission of the MPP is to equip these individuals to be able to work well with others, particularly those with whom they might have some profound disagreements on politics and policy, in order to be able to still formulate useful government interventions that advance human flourishing. On our behalf, we are delighted to welcome you here to the Blavatnik School's admission community. We hope you have all of um, your questions answered over the course of the next session. And if you have, of course, any further reason to engage with us on these questions, please don't hesitate to continue to reach out to our admissions team. Thank you and all the best. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to you all from the Blavatnik School of Government. Um, we are absolutely delighted that you have chosen to join us here today. Um, thank you so much for that. My name is Helen. I work in the external relations team here at the school um, and I'm going to be moderating today's session. Um, we've got around an hour um, to try and answer as many questions um, that you have as possible. Please put them into the Q&A function in the Zoom. Um, and thank you so much to those who pre-submitted questions. That was super helpful. Um, we're going to get started and I'm going to ask my colleagues who are with me here today to introduce themselves. Richenda. Hello, um, just again, a huge welcome from all of us here. We're thrilled that so many people have, um, have decided to join this webinar today. I'm Rachenda Gamble's Director of Admissions at the school, and my job is to oversee the decisions that we make across all three of our programmes, the MPP, the MSC and the DPhil. And of course, today we're going to spend most of our time talking about the MPP and the MSC, but we can also, if people want to, also focus a little bit on the default. Anyway, just a huge welcome from me. I'm Beatrice, I'm the admissions officer. Um, my role kind of um, involves coordinating and overseeing the administrative side of the admissions process for all three of our programs, so the MPP, the MSC and the default, um, and just making sure that all of the applications we receive are ready for assessment and making sure they're all getting assessed. Uh, and I'll be answering a bit of everything, questions and admissions, but uh, if you have any questions about funding or about application requirements, then do leave these in the chat. Thank you for coming. My name is Ruth. I'm an admissions and programmes officer for our brand new MSc in public policy research, which will be launched in September. Very exciting. My course director, um, Professor Peter Kemp. And I'll be mainly focusing on the MSc and public policy research, but also the one plus one route, which you may be interested in hearing more about. Great, thank you so much. So we're going to kick off um, with the first question that I'm going to put to Achanda, which is what makes the Blavatnik School so unique? Why would somebody want to come here to study? So I think to build on what Karthik said in, in his opening lines about building unlikely coalitions, why is it that people build these unlikely coalitions? And I think that is largely because of the incredible student body that we assemble each year at the Blavatnik School across all three programmes, but particularly the MPP, because that's our largest programme. We have around 140 students joining us now each year. And these students come from over 50 different countries. And they come a 90% or over 90% to come from outside of the UK. So it's an incredibly international diverse community, which just means that people can spend so much time learning from others. And of course, it's not just the nationalities that gives the school its diversity. It's also the range of policy interests that people come with. So 
you know, we've got people who are absolutely passionate climate experts. We've got people focused on public health, education, cybersecurity. Any number of policy focused challenges and issues are represented amongst the student body. And just learning about the different challenges that people are focused on, the different ways that they've approached it, just provides a toolkit for people to take forward for the rest of their lives forever. And it provides a community that they can turn to and draw on to think about getting advice and thinking about how to help make decisions whilst they're on the MPP, but for many years beyond. And of course, other public policy schools have students from all around the world, but I don't think in quite the same numbers and in quite the same percentages and proportions. And I think that to me is what makes the school particularly unique. And then just other, I mean, there's there's other things that I would, you know, think about like, you know, we're in, we're a fairly new program. We're only 10 years old. It's a purpose built program. It's cutting edge. It's absolutely sort of at the heart of where the policy debates are right now. And I just think, you know, it's purpose built and such an applied program. And all of those things come together to make it a unique and amazing experience. And that's relating to the MPP. But I think it's it's true and it's something that cuts across all three of the programs. It's just the quality and amazingness of the student body and the newness of our programs. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned alumni and we have over a thousand alumni. So we've built this amazing community of support and advice for current students. And then, as you say, moving forward as careers progress yep. through the through the years to come. So we can talk a bit more about alumni um, later if we have any further questions. But um, they are a huge part of what makes this school what it is. Absolutely. And our alumni are so connected to the school. And we recently had um, a 10 year celebratory event and more than 600 people came to Oxford uh, to return to celebrate being part of the school and I think that's just a testament to how exciting the school is and how connected people feel to it and so I think sort of to add further to this point about uniqueness it's that diversity and that community that is created um, yeah. which is which is I think just something really special. Thank you Richenda. Um, just going on we've had some questions about the criteria that we're looking for etc for applicants. So Beatrice, um, can you give us an overview of the, the entry requirements for the MPP and you know what kind of things people should be looking out for when they're when they're applying? So our entry requirements really the main aspect um, academic um, excellence to date. Uh, you'll see on our website that we do require applicants to have a high 2-1 or a first equivalent or, or equivalent. Um, for example, for the US, that's usually a 3.7 GPA out of 4. Um, we do have information available on international qualifications and international equivalencies if you'd like to get in touch with us if you have any questions about those. Uh, but those are our main entry requirements in terms of academic requirements. Uh, however, our selection criteria is threefold and they're all assessed um, completely holistically and we look at all three of these aspects which are academic as I mentioned but then also um, commitment to public policy and leadership and impact so those are three main um, application I mean admissions requirements so what we'll be assessing our applications against and what we want to see throughout your application thank you very much and just going on that the kinds of um... Uh, criteria that we look for. What kind of examples do we have? Examples of the kind of leadership um, or past experience, sorry, needed to demonstrate that kind of leadership that we're looking for? Yeah. So, um, in terms of past experience, as Richenda has touched upon, uh, our cohort is just so incredibly diverse. That's not just in terms of you know nationalities or ethnic backgrounds. It's also just from their professional and educational backgrounds. So we've got loads of people that come from completely different you know, degree backgrounds. We don't have any specific degree requirement. We get loads of people that come obviously from political careers, but we do also get people from engineering, medicine, education, journalism. There's just a huge range. There's no specific requirement. Um, so anyone is welcome to apply regardless of kind of what they've studied or what their mm -hmm. professional experience is today. Um, and on political, I mean, on, leadership and impact mm -hmm. um it's not all about the experience that they've already had it's also about kind of potential um and showing that they have 
the promise that they'll be able to do these things. But I don't know if Richard will say anything on that. I think what you said is really helpful and really clear. But yeah, just to sort of build on this this idea of, of potential in every application, we are looking for sort of a trajectory, and we're looking for we're looking for the sort of you know evidence of a commitment to public service and a commitment of sort of you know leadership and impact so far and then sort of a really clear rationale for why the MPP is the next step in that journey and then evidence of what might the MPP allow in terms of the future so how is it going to then take you forward in the context of your mission in relation to public service and your mission in relation to really making a difference in that space and showing leadership and, and having impact and that would be true for you know we we get applications from people from age 21 right through until sort of you know 60 plus the majority of our students who join us are sort of in the 25 to 35 mm -hmm. year sort of span but of course we take younger students and we take older students and for everyone that joins on course we're looking for achievement and promise and purpose in the past and that sort of drive and passion to continue that so motivation and trajectory i think are at the heart of of those those two particular sort of elements of the admissions criteria which accompany the academic as as, as beatrice has, has has set out thank you thank you oh, and, and can i just add that yeah. you know beatrice has absolutely said you know what our sort of you know preferred minimums are but to to stress it's a holistic assessment and so if you've absolutely aced it in public service and leadership and impact and you do things like submit the most incredible um, piece of written work that can go a little way to make up for a slightly lower academic record it is that always sort of holistic assessment mm -hmm. of the file as a whole perfect that's really helpful thank you um, i'm going to bring reith in now um, to talk about our MSc and one plus one. So can you give us um, a kind of an idea of why a student might apply for the one plus one and and what is the different kind of career trajectory um, for a one plus one graduate versus somebody who's just done the, the MPP? That's a really good question. So as Richenda talked about previously, the main point of the MPP is that leadership training for public service, whereas the MSc is really focused towards those candidates who are looking for a career in research in the future, whether that's a pathway to a DPhil, a PhD, whether that's at Oxford itself or another institution. It's really the stepping stone to go from leadership role to working in a research related job, whether that's in government, a charity, not for profit organisation. It's going to give you the training and the skills that you need in statistics, qualitative methods, how to write in a fantastic research proposal um, as part of the degree course. You also have to work, um, write a 10,000 word thesis. So lots of your time will be working and developing on that. And you also have the experience to work with faculty within the school who are working on research and are really passionate about potentially the field that you're focusing on as well. So that's kind of the one plus one route and the different career routes mm -hmm. that you might be interested in. And is there anything about the application process of the one plus one that you might want to highlight to to anyone considering that? So the first thing is treat the applications as two separate applications. So have a look at the entry requirements for the MPP, the entry requirements for the MSc. So the MSc is focusing on the commitment to improving public policy through research. So you really need to have a think about what the two admissions committees are looking for in your application. As part of the MSc, you'll have to submit a research proposal. Um, Peter Kemp has written a blog post um, up on our website, which I'd really recommend looking at for the top tips on how to write a successful research proposal. I think the main thing is also to state in your personal statement, I wish to be considered for the one plus one public policy week. So making those assessors aware that we'll treat your application as study in the first year of the MPP and second year in the MSc, and also really tailor your application. So show us, as Richenda talked about your career trajectory, show us why you want to go into research. Why do you want to do a one plus one week? Perfect, thank you. Um, one of the questions that often comes up um, that we get is about funding. So how can somebody find funding? What is there, what scholarships are out there and, and what's open to, to particular students from say different countries? So um, Beatrice, is there, a, is there a kind of 
an overview you can give us because it's it's not it, it can be quite a complicated system we try and make everything as easy as possible for people on the website there's lots of information on our website um, about the different funding rates but Beatrice do you want to give us an overview of funding yeah so I mean at the school we're really proud to say that we um, have this year upwards of 80 percent of our MPP students come with some form of funding I think it's about 70 percent come with full funding then an extra 10 percent have partial funding um, the three main routes to get funding that we see from our students is through university scholarships, through school scholarships, and through external funding. Uh, so if I just briefly mention some of those, University of Oxford scholarships, the university as a whole has a huge range of scholarships available. I want to say hundreds if not thousands of uh, scholarships are available, and you are automatically considered for all of the ones that you're eligible for as long as you apply by our deadline in January, um, the university will, um, you know, figure out the eligibility and see which ones you might be in the running for. Um, so you don't really need to do anything for those. It's just all automatic. There's just a couple of university scholarships that you might need to do some extra forms for. So I do recommend looking at the university website. Um, but the vast majority of them you're enrolled for automatically. Then school scholarships at the school, we have an amazing network. Um, of donors, and um, we just have the, you know, incredible chance of um, helping students come on course with some funding. So there is a number of scholarships that we have that are advertised on our website. You can have a look at those. Again, you'll be um, considered automatically. So if you apply for a program and you're successful in getting an offer in March, uh, we'll send you a questionnaire that will um, kind of ask you some questions about your background and what your elig eligibility for different scholarships is. So again, we've got uh, quite a big range of scholarships um, to help students come on course, and those will be kind of automatically considered for. And then a big chunk of the funding that our students come from is external. So whether that's external organizations, employers, governments, funding bodies, there's just a huge range. Um, things like the Achievement Scholarship funds a lot of our students every year, and then a lot of our students that come from government posts and government employment come with um, funding from their employers. Um, so our general advice is to all of our applicants to look everywhere um, to explore any avenue that you know is is available. Um, look to see if your local government or your uh, local organizations might have opportunities to help you get funding. Look through the university website, look through our website, because there's definitely loads mm -hmm. of opportunities available. And as I say, the vast majority of the students come with funding, so it's definitely possible um, to get the funding. It's not, you know, uh, an unachievable kind of dream to get yeah. funding, I think. Yeah. And, and just to add to that, um, I couldn't agree more with what Beatrice has said about being proactive even now, um, you know, it's never too early to start looking for scholarship opportunities. But just to, to hopefully slightly reassure, once the offers are made and, and our own scholarship questionnaire has been sent um, to people who are successful with their offers, then we will work as hard as we can here at the school to help support you, be it through making sure that we're that you are being considered for the university scholarships that you are eligible for and considering you too for the school scholarships that you might be eligible for. So we're there to support you. You're not completely on your own, um, but you do need to be really proactive um, and that needs to start now. Mm -hmm. And we've really worked very hard to make sure that, you know, finances are not a barrier to coming to the school. It's it's a huge priority for us because, you know, we want excellent students to come to the school and we don't want anything to be a barrier to that. So, um, as my colleagues have said, there's lots of information on the website, but we're always here to help you navigate that route. Um, Ruth, on the one plus one, are there any funding issues that people should be aware of because they're going to be looking for funding for two years rather than one. One thing to really mention is road scholars. So they often come with two years funding, um, Japanese government scholars as well. We've had Japanese government scholars come with two years of funding. So really explore whether your funder can offer that two years of funding. If you log on to the MSC website, you can also filter by um, which scholarships you might be eligible for. Um, we also have some great scholarships attached to certain colleges. It's worth looking at Exeter College, for example. We have really good relationships with them, um, the Jardine, for example. So look at the website, look at the fields, um, look at kind of the university guidance 
But if you do have concerns and you think actually two years of funding up front, I'm a little bit worried about this, I'm not sure, um, apply for the MPP first. And then when you come on course, there's always the opportunity to apply for the MSc. So don't let funding put you off would be my advice. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just looking at all the wonderful questions that you've been sending us through. Thank you so much for that. Um, just going back, um, Thomas has asked an interesting question about uh, in terms of leadership and impact. We were talking about that earlier. Um, what kinds of examples should we have in mind for demonstrating a past and future commitment to public policy? So are there any tips we can give Thomas on that? I think um, in the space of sort of leadership and impact, we're not just looking for sort of, for example, statements and, and CVs that just list um, positions and achievements. That can be helpful, but it's not in and itself, it's not enough. What we're looking for is the nuance and the detail behind that. So, you know, you got to X role in a particular organisation and that sounds very impressive. Great. But what did you do in that role and what were your achievements in that role and you've done that and so why do you want to do the mpp well because you want to take that set of achievements to the next level and you want to multiply and you want to amplify that that so it's about it's about sort of giving more of a story and about giving more behind the sort of the headline statements about sort of what's happened in your life to enable us to really see the ways in which you have developed, devised projects, campaigns, you know, just the achievements that you have, 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 have made, of which we know that there are many because we have read thousands of applications and each year we are so humbled by what we read, but we just need, we, we're looking for very specific examples of where you have, ha you have really shown commitment to something and really made a difference in that area. And that can be at a university level through sort of, you know, kind of university fundraising societies, extracurricular events. It can be when you're 40 years old and deeply into your career. And, you know, it's, it's about, looking at the sort of you know the kind of the get up and go the motivation and the and 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 i suppose the sort of are you the sort of person that just goes the extra mile and just makes amazing things happen as a result of that yeah so i hope that's helpful no that's wonderful that is great and i'm going to go to a few more questions that we've had um from you all thank you so much for that firstly on the actual application process itself so beatrice i don't know if this is one for you but um the process for, for example, Tariq has asked how to write a successful policy analysis essay and public commitment essay. Are there areas in the application process where um, perhaps people make common mistakes or advice you might give somebody writing these essays? I mean, I think common mistakes generally in the written parts, but also in the application as a whole. Um, it's really people sometimes forget um, what our selection criteria is and forget that we assess applications holistically as a whole. Um, so of course the public service essay is a really good time to be showcasing how you meet our requirement for commitment to public service, but you really should be showing your commitment to public service throughout the application. So throughout all your written work and throughout all of um, the documents that you submit with your application, keep in mind our three admissions requirements. So academic excellence to date, commitment to public service, leadership and impact. Uh, make sure that that really is reflected throughout your application. Make sure that there's a thread through your application, I would say, and that you're showing your trajectory. So what have you done to date? What do you plan on doing? What would you learn from the MPP? And what would you also bring to the MPP? I think those are things that are really important to be covered in the application and that perhaps sometimes people forget they think of the different sections of the application of very separate documents, but actually you should think of your application as a whole. So put it all together and make sure that it all follows kind of a story and the requirements that we have. Um, I don't know if Richenda wants to add anything on that. Just, just a reminder to, to read the guidance that we've already yeah. put actually on our website about sort of, you know, what you need to include in an application and the supporting documents are really important, all of them. Um, and I think just, I think Beatrice has sort of, you know, really nicely covered sort of, you know, 
the, the span of those supporting documents, but just, just to touch on the written work. So we asked for a 1,500 uh, word policy essay. And just, you know, one of the common mistakes that we see um, is that people submit maybe, uh, I don't know, a thesis of a, a, a chapter from a previous degree that's about 10,000 words long. That's just not really very helpful. Um, it also doesn't show real engagement with what we're trying to achieve in the course, which is somebody who is wanting to take previous academic knowledge and think about applying it in the context of public policy. And so that's what we're looking for in the written work. Can you take your academic insights and really apply it to a policy area? We're not expecting a perfect piece. You haven't done the MPP yet, but um, but you know we're looking for the mindset of wanting to try to do that and to think about taking a policy challenge that is of interest to them and think through how might they analyze the problem and what kind of recommendations might they think about moving forward so i think you know so absolutely what beatrice is saying about sort of you know remembering our criteria weaving that through the application letting us see a sort of a thread and narrative an insight into who you are and what your focus is and just just you know and thinking about that in the context of the written work as well thank you um if somebody for example is thinking perhaps i'll just do i'll i'll, I'll carry on for another year um in my job or you know whatever i'm doing and perhaps I'll, I'll think about reapplying to the mpp next year rather than this year are there any um is there any advice that you might have for somebody who's thinking of reapplying for the mpp if they've applied one year and then perhaps not got in or they'd like to to, to apply for the next year you know anything extra that they'd add to their application is there advice that we can provide them if they haven't um, been successful first year round? Yeah, I mean, I think what we say to everyone when they ask us this question is that each year is a separate cycle. So if one year you haven't had an offer, um, that doesn't mean that, you know, it's definitely going to be a no in a future year. It just means that perhaps you need to look back at your application, see what you submitted, kind of, um, you know, reevaluate, improve the work that you've uh, submitted. Um, make sure that, as we say, it meets our, our um, selection criteria. And in the year between, you know, applying and maybe not getting in and then reapplying, uh, what can you do to strengthen that application? So, of course, a year should only make your application stronger if you're spending that year working towards, you know, public service or working towards your leadership and impact or towards your commitment to helping people. Um, so definitely you shouldn't be deterred if, you know, you weren't successful one year. Um, but do look back at your application to see what you can improve. As we're saying, um, kind of weave through the whole application how you really think that you would be an asset for the school, how you would learn from the MPP and what you would bring to the table. Um, I think that's our main line of advice for reappliers. Thank you very much. Um, just going to the questions that we've been asked, Eugene has asked a very interesting question um, about career services available at school for people who are looking to transition into careers into the um, public service. Now, we are we are certainly have been strengthening the facilities and resources, I should say, that we have here at the school on providing career support and advice. Um, we also obviously some <coughs> projects are part of the um, the MP of the year that that students spend um, time here. I don't know if we want to take that in two areas. Perhaps talk about the summer projects first and how that is helpful for students carrying out the MPP, and also the kind of careers advice that we might help that mm -hmm. we might offer um, people as they're looking to perhaps transition into different um, different sectors. Mm -hmm. So what do you want me to talk to you for summer projects? For sure. So, um, I mean, the summer project is something that really excites um, our applicants and our, our students. It's, it's something that comes obviously at the end of the year. And so it's an opportunity to draw on everything that you have learned over the year and apply it to something that you yourself are massively committed to so you're supported at the school from the beginning in terms of thinking through what would make for a strong summer project about approaching potential hosts um, we have a summer project team that are there to support you but also you know your supervisors your academic supervisors can talk with you about um, really helping you hone in what 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 your focus is going to be 
<clears throat> and and then sort of you know you're 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 thinking about that in 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 sort of you know the first term that you're at the school in the second term that you're at the school you're tending to apply for projects um either that you've come up with yourself or that the school has has secured and then sort of you know different people are applying to those and then in the third term, people are often working on the focus um, and the detail of the project. So working with their host to really think about sort of, you know, let's refine the question, make sure that the question speaks to a, a, a problem that we all want to get an answer to. Mm -hmm. And then thinking about how to make sure that your project is going to provide that answer. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just, you know, I think students have an absolutely brilliant time on the summer project they've all been in oxford together from september through until um the end of june it's been an amazing experience and then they all go off uh, some people to london some stay in oxford and but others just go off all around the world and everyone's in touch with each other because you know they're all whatsapping all the time but you know they're just having these amazing experiences where they've been in the classroom they've been working together and then they're just released into the world again um, and just really having an opportunity to just apply their insights into sort of you know a real world setting mm -hmm. and coming up with some great insights and recommendations as a result so it's it's just it's a brilliant way to end the MPP and something that rightly the students get really excited about and of course you know it feeds into um future careers because a lot of people want to do a summer project in an area that they want to move more into some people are coming from the ngo world and they want to get more into government so you know they secure a place in a government setting mm -hmm. and that can be the beginning of something else or you know it's 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 it just links very nicely yeah. with the with the yeah. careers and just um just picking up on some of the questions that we've had um uh given that the summer project's obviously all full time um somebody a couple of people have asked whether it's possible to work and do the mpp so have a job mm. alongside it's not something we encourage at all not at all um it's it would be a nightmare to try to work alongside the mpp the mpp is a really fabulous but intense experience mm -hmm. and every hour of your day will be taken up on the course or in the extracurriculars around the course and it, yeah it's 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 not a not a, not, not a good idea, not a good idea. No, you will be very busy if you come to the school uh, all day every day um and you know not just during the day we also offer a lot of kind of extra cur curriculum activities here at the school we have fantastic engagement from um uh, public public sector leaders who come to speak at the school really interesting speakers um we try and offer a real range of um views um experiences for our students to learn from um, and the students themselves have very active social lives. Um, we also have a lot of networking activities with our alumni. Um, we host, host events regularly, um, not just in this country, but overseas as well, so that alumni can all get together. But the students here um, have a fantastic opportunity to, to really mix with our alumni and get a lot of advice and experience from them um, as they sort of progress. Um, is there anything that you want to say about activities within the school as part of the MPP? Mm. I'm just trying to think if there's, uh, I mean, as well as the speakers that we have who come to speak um, to the students, there's, they have so much access so, to Q&A. Absolutely. Um, with really interesting people and speakers from all over the globe. There's so much that takes place in the school. So many, as, as Helen is, is, has been saying, so many amazing speakers um, come and talk at the school. Students themselves also put on a whole load of events um, that draw on their own sort of policy experiences or you know interests. Um, but also, just actually, students put stuff on that sort of you know culturally um, of interest to them. So you know, we'll we'll have sort of you know the specific nights of Brazil night um, or sort of you know indian evening mm -hmm. and you know and 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 people from those countries will just sort of you know share food and 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 and, and dancing or just you know it's so there's there's such a lot that goes mm -hmm. on in the school um and then of course there's the wider university mm -hmm. so and and people's colleges so there's never a shortage of things to do the problem that anyone coming to oxford has is working out what to focus their time mm -hmm. on and um and and one of my own supervisees this year 
they they came to me in sort of the second week of, of term and and just said you need to help me I, I i don't know how to fit everything in and he started listing all these things that he wanted to engage in it's like so you're asking me to organize your life <laughs> fine okay you just need to cut back <laughs> and make sure that whatever you do you spend time as well focusing on the mpp mm -hmm. and studying so you need to do all of that but then beyond that there's never going to be a shortage of things to do your challenge will be just focusing yeah, on specific exactly things and, and and as richenda mentioned the wider university provides a lot of support for students um, you will have you know you'll be in your own college um, and you'll have a wonderful support network with the college um, here we have you know welfare support and help for students um, who you know who 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 might encounter difficulties um, we also have students who come with their families and just integrating into oxford and if you especially if you're moving from another country um, you know is is quite tough so we provide a lot of help and support for people um, who are coming to oxford certainly for the first time um, to help them really feel settled um, into oxford which is you know it's going to be their home for the next year um, so, you know, we're always here to provide help and advice on that. So if anyone has any questions about just the kind of transition from where you are now to coming to Oxford, then, you know, we're always here to answer any questions on that. Um, I'm just going to have a look to see what other kind of questions we've had here. Um, talking about alumni referrals. Sorry, Richenda, did you want to? Well, help? while you were looking, I was yeah. just going to, you, you'd asked earlier about careers and we'd managed mm. not to. So, oh yes. We should so speak just to, that. just to say yeah. about that, just because I'm really excited about this. Um, so we've always, you know, we've always had, you know, the summer project and the sort of mm -hmm. the summer project placements and the summer project team um, that has all and and that's always been a really helpful and, and brilliant way that people can kind of connect to organisations and then potential careers. And our alumni community is just ever growing and and sort of an ever amazing source of mm -hmm. of support and and sharing of potential opportunities but um but this year we've launched this new sort of careers accelerator um and it's so and the purpose of that is because for the best will in the world you know the i think i think it's over 80% of our alumni want to be working in public policy and government, but yet we're not at that level mm -hmm. yet. And, and, and Nairi Woods, the Dean of our school, has said that, you know, endlessly she gets um, adverts from the business community and they're wanting her to share this amongst um, our network. And she never gets it from sort of, you know, public policy organisations. And so we're trying to kind of we're trying to change that culture, and so we, we we've got um we've got an amazing new new team who are really focused on building those connections with organisations, and you know we've got a dedicated sort of head of careers who's going to really I think just sort of support and help current students and alum. Um, so I think you know sort of we're just doing ever more in this space mm -hmm. um, with the aim of you know sort of getting more and more of our alum working in positions of government where they can make such a massive difference yeah. in the world so that's i, I was just that's conscious helpful. that we'd left that no, that's, um, that's super helpful and it is a really kind of holistic uh, you know offering that we that we have here at the school and the wonderful thing is we have alum coming back who are now in positions of you know being ministers or very very senior civil servants in governments um, across the world who you know, come back and talk to, to our students and give them their experiences of things like running for office um, and how their career has, 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 um, has evolved. So we're super lucky that we have that as well as part of our kind of career offering. But yeah, as Richenda said, this is a really strengthened offering um, on the career side of things for students. So we're really, really excited about that. Um, uh, and I was just looking at some of the questions here um somebody has asked evan has asked whether it's common for people from the consulting sector to be admitted to the mpp and we have had people from consulting organizations i believe who've joined us on the mpp so um that is um that's you know where to be honest we are you know we are super happy to to look at applications from as long as 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 they they you know meet the requirements as we've outlined today so just i mean and and just on that sort of you know Absolutely. There's no, there's no sort of, you know, background that is sort of, you know, off limits mm -hmm. in terms of professional 
past experience or academic sort of trajectories and backgrounds. But I think in the context of a specific question about sort of, you know, a consultancy background, what would what we would be looking is what work have you been doing in, the, in, in when you've been doing consultancy and has it been sort of public policy focused? Mm -hmm. Has it been working on the issues that sort of, you know, relate to government challenges, problems, issues? So, you know, are you working with a consultancy organisation looking at education and access, for example? Um, and but then also sort of what's the the reason for doing the MPP? Is it to continue in the consultancy space or is it to transition into a more sort of you know government kind of role? Um, and these are all the questions that we would be asking mm -hmm. when we're looking at, at an application in that in that context. Wonderful. I hope that answers your question. Um, just we were talking about colleges earlier um, and. Ansh has asked how the collegiate experience on the MPP differs from being an undergraduate in Oxford um, and that given that the degree is, is taught, our MPP is taught mostly in the school rather than the college system. So mm -hmm. is there a huge difference between um, the undergraduate system? Yeah, I mean, generally, um, undergraduate degrees, a lot of the teaching is done in the college. Uh, graduate level, so that's not just the MPP, my understanding is that's for all graduate courses, all the teaching is done at the department. Everyone still will get a college offer and everyone, well, every one of our students will be affiliated with a college, but that won't necessarily be as much academic involvement. I think at a graduate level, uh, the college is more there for a community, for support, um, and just for, you know, belonging to one extra kind of group and community, but the teaching is within the school. Another difference is that um, at undergraduate level, you're guaranteed to have college accommodation, whereas at graduate level, you're not guaranteed accommodation. Um, I think the majority of our students still get accommodation at colleges. Uh, it really depends from one college to another, you know, how large they are, how much accommodation they have. Uh, but so that's one other difference between the undergraduate and the graduate. Um, so as I say, all of our students, all graduate students will be, um, you know, affiliated with a college and will get an offer to join a college, uh, but it is slightly different than an undergraduate level. Mm -hmm. And Thank just you. to chip in there, if you are interested in applying for the Public Policy One Plus route, the aim is that you will stay with the same college for your second year as well. It's important to note, if you are looking at applying for the One Plus One route, there's a list of accepting colleges for the One Plus One. Perfect. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, Moving on to talking about content, course content, um, Shantanu has asked, um, is strong data statistical skills a prerequisite for the course, or is that something that is taught as part of the course? Mm -hmm. Now, we do have a huge amount of information um, on our website that details um, the course, what the course teaches um, for each term. But is that, is to, I mean, I don't know for the, perhaps for the one plus one, whether that's something that's a real um, integral part of yeah. the uh, of the one plus one. I'm happy to take this question. But like, so in the MPP, you will have um, an applied public policy module on evidence and public policy, which will go into some of the basic statistics skills. Um, there's also an applied policy module focus on statistics, and there are two groups. I think there's a beginner level and an advanced level. And then if you did come on to the MSc in public policy research, there's a whole dedicated module on statistics and public policy. But the idea is that you will have those skills and you'll be taught. So there are some students who are scared of statistics when they come and say, oh my goodness, this is amazing. Like it's really overwhelming. And then we have some people who have got a really mathematical kind of data background and they will go into the advanced set. That's the kind of background on data. Wonderful. That's super helpful. And, and, and just to add on that, you know, just if, if you if you bear in mind the fact that people are coming from a, a huge array of different sort of you know, academic disciplines that they've studied at undergraduate level, you're not going to be an expert in all of the different modules that we have in the MPP. And, you know, sort of we, we, to talk about the MPP, we have economics for public policy. We have uh, foundations, which is a, a sort of philosophical um, set of reflections in the context of um, public policy. We have law for public policy. We have evidence for public policy, which we sort of introduce and develop statistical ability um, to think about evidence. And we have a course around politics and uh, the organisation of, of, of government. So, you know, there's different there's different core modules that speak to different academic disciplines. But each of those modules 
it it provides a sort of you know a, a a sort of an understanding for people who are new to the subject but it also provides opportunities for experts in those subjects to dive deeper and and delve and and i think you know sort of no one's an expert in all of these fields and actually the purpose of the course is to bring together and synthesize these different lenses to analyze a public policy problem and then to utilize that sort of you know that um that holistic knowledge to really then think through public policy and so i think there genuinely is something for every everyone some people stumble in some of the cl the, the courses and the modules that they're unfamiliar with but coming back to this amazing community that you become part of last year for example one of our um, education reps set up sort of workshops um, where an expert in in their particular discipline supported students who were feeling a little unsure mm -hmm. in, in a discipline mm -hmm. and that happened across all of the different modules and it just it you know it just shows how students are encouraged and do work together as a community um, to support each other to get through the material which is a real which is really what the school is all about. Yeah. It is all about help, helping students, supporting them, but but as a community, students supporting each other, which yeah. is which is wonderful to see. Um, I'm going to go back to some questions that we've had, um, and forgive me if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Jelsina has asked um, if having a gap year during their under, undergraduate degree is seen negatively by the admissions committee. Um, I guess that speaks to the experience that you have gained on your gap year, but I don't know if you want to um, answer that question, Beatrice. Yeah, I mean, I think, as you mentioned, I think it's all about, you know, what have you been doing during that gap year? Mm -hmm. Having a gap year per se won't necessarily be a negative. Um, what have you been doing? Do you want to, you know, include it as your application? Do you think that's a selling point um, of your application to the school? Uh, but I think just short answer is no it wouldn't necessarily be a negative mm -hmm. uh, i don't see any reason why it would be no exactly um here's an interesting question from erica and thank you so much for putting this question forward um erica has has been thinking about applying but she has felt it's a little difficult because she is quite a shy person and you know when you you have to put your application in and write your your um, essays you really have to push yourself forward and really sort of um really expand on what you've been doing and 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 put over your best side all the 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 um the experience that you've got and your commitment to public service how might somebody do that if they're feeling a little hesitant to kind of um you know it's difficult sometimes to, to be to be particularly confident in what we're writing about ourselves is there are there any tips that you would give somebody for for how they might you know write their application and make the best use of 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 their qualifications and and what the, their experience and what they've been up to i'll defer to colleagues because because <laughs> you you often get this sort of yeah. question from from mm -hmm. applicants so and i can chip in at the end but i think the first thing is to really maybe start brainstorming so if you're working on your personal statement maybe make a list of here are all the things that I've done, <laughs> even if you feel shy or not very confident about doing that and look at how they relate to the criteria. So look at how that skill relates to your commitment and public service, maybe matching them up. Mm -hmm. um, I'd also encourage you not to go with like one of the templates that you see online. Um, mm -hmm. Don't just go online and read a template. Really try and see if you can find your own voice. through. Don't be kind of afraid to um, put yourself out there and if it comes across maybe not as um, kind of confident, um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's being honest about what you have achieved and making a list of um, your proudest moments, maybe. Yeah, that's that's great. I hope that was helpful, Erica. Um, uh, you know, as as Ruth has um, suggested, we you know we are here to help with with um, with people who are who have questions about their application, about their personal statement. So if there's anything else, do get in touch with us. There are all the details on the website that we can um, help you further. Um, I'm going to go back to some of the questions that we have from um, uh, people uh, who have very kindly joined us. We've been asked a question, which I think is a pretty quick answer. Do we have a student exchange program with other universities for selected modules? No, that's the good answer. <laughs> so, but no, I hope that's a quick answer to your question. Um, professional recommendations. Um, a question from Eugene again. Hi, Eugene. Um, when looking for letters of recommendation, would a professional recommendation letter be useful for someone who's been out of academics for about a, um, a decade? 
Um, so what is there any advice we can give on on the kind of professional recommendations that that people might be looking for for the parts of their application? I think we always like to see at least one professional reference. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we write in the guidance that we want at least one academic. Yeah. Um, so of course you can have three academic. Um, mm -hmm. One has to be an academic one. But you know we really like the, the references to be a blend of, of academic and professional. And that that includes sort of you know for younger applicants because you know you can have a, a reference from someone who, for example, you've been doing lots of volunteering mm -hmm. with. And the reason that we want to have not just academic, but also sort of, you know, professional is because it just speaks to what we're trying to do in admissions, which is to assess your file against three different criteria. And so to have a professional reference probably is going to speak more to your commitment to public service and your leadership and impact not necessarily more than the academic, but it gives a different lens. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it just rounds out the application in a better way yeah. if we can have a combination of both um, academic and professional references. And there is advice that is given to references, academic and professional, when they are asked to, to submit a reference. You know, they are, they are sort of, you know, there are specific things that referees are prompted mm -hmm. to address in, in the letter. So, um, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. I think, you know, if you're interested in applying for the MPP, you just, or the MSC, or the DPhil, you just need to, to think about who are going to be the people who are going to be able to speak best about, mm -hmm. sort of, you know, why I'm such a good fit for the programme. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Ruth, is there anything additional on that for the one plus one that would yeah. be helpful to so point out? For the MSC part of your application, you need to provide two academic references. That's really important because the MSC is really more focused on the academic side. So have a think about who that might be. Um, it could be someone that you work with at your current university or institution. Um, in terms of the personal statement, I'm thinking maybe they would be a good person to even go to and ask and look at the personal statement beforehand so they know what they're commenting on as well. When they get that email through saying, I need to write a reference on this person, they've got the personal statement to hand to comment on. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, Talal has asked a question about the public policy essay uh, that's required as part of the, public, uh, part of the application, excuse me, um, asking if it's possible to write about a previous project um, uh, that, uh, that an applicant has been involved in, which I assume is, is fine. Absolutely. Um, I mean, so, you know, our, our, our requirements are, are, are sort of word limit because we want to be able to see that you can kind of address something succinctly. Um, so as long as it's within word link, limit, um, that it identifies a sort of, you know, a policy problem, it offers some analysis around that that problem and then thinks about sort of you know potential recommendations for moving forward it, the subject matter can be whatever works yeah. for for you and if it's something that you've been directly engaged in great you may well have insights um that are particularly interesting or, or unique um and so yeah i mean it sounds like a good idea to to to, to focus that on on something that you're very familiar with perfect thank you um, and talking about references, Thomas has asked at what point in the process are those taken into account? So are they requested for all applications or only where candidates have passed an initial SIFT? So they're requested for all applicants. Essentially, when you apply, you're applying to Central University. We don't get to see your application until it's complete. Uh, but as soon as you register your referees, um, Central University will send them an automated email inviting them to submit a reference. It does give them some information, as Richanda mentioned, as to kind of what areas they should cover and specific information that's required. Um, but so, yes, before you submit your application, you have to list, um, I believe it's those three references. You can list more if you want, but you need to have at least three uh, and they'll be automatically notified. Um, that's not to say that you need them immediately as soon as you submit your reference. You can click submit even before your referees have submitted your references. Um, and as long as we receive the references before the application deadline in January, then that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, and you can track whether they've um, submitted the references or not on the application portal. And that way, if you want to, you can prompt them if they're, um, you know, haven't submitted it yet. Um, so, yeah. 
there's one reason to get your application in early yes, before definitely. Christmas before the <laughs> 6th of January deadline rolls around I think um, yeah for references to that's that. a very good point about the timing um, and just getting back to um, we talked about recommendation letters um, and Noor has asked if it's okay if officers only submit professional recommendation letters but I think you're saying Richenda that academic reference letters are also required Absolutely. Um, for the MPP, we absolutely require one um, and you're welcome to submit two um, if that's the combination that you opt for. And as Ruth said, for the MSC, it's two. I believe it's two for the DPhil as well. Yes. So for, for all of our programmes, we require an academic reference. Mm -hmm. And really, I think you need to think really carefully about who that comes from. Um, it's always a good idea to go with someone who really knows you um and has worked with you um but at the same time we know that some people have been out of of, of university mm -hmm. for say 10 15 years and it's it's just it's very challenging to mm -hmm. get an academic reference but the university does require that we have at least one academic reference so it's it may be a challenge but but we do need everyone to submit at least one for the mpp and two for the other programs Okay, thank you for that. Um, just another question on the essay on social impact work that has been done. Somebody is asking whether um, the evidence that's provided in that essay can be work that's been done on quite a small scale or rather than something that's been done on quite a large project. I mean, I would I would have thought that actually it's it's how you demonstrate that you meet that particular criteria mm. in that essay that matters, not really the size of a project that you've worked on necessarily. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think different people are applying with different levels of experience, different types of experience. And, you know, regardless of, of the age of, of, of a, an applicant, what they could be working on might be a small project, but that doesn't mean it's not a project that doesn't have impact and scale. So it, what we're looking for is sort of, you know, how have you engaged in that project? Mm -hmm. um, what kind of sort of, you know, what kind of player have you been? What kind of leader have you been? Have you been someone who has, you know, just, you know, supported others to succeed? Have you been someone who, um, through what you're doing, is actually empowering other people to have, you know, a much more enhanced experience? And so, and, and that can all happen through a small scale project. Um, and sometimes you can see that much more visibly. So, so it's, it's, to speak exactly to your point, it's not the size, it's it's what have you been doing and what does this tell us about your potential mm -hmm. and ability? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I'm very conscious that we have about one and a half minutes left. Um, the hour has gone incredibly quickly. Um, I hope we've managed to answer as many questions of yours as possible. Um, if not, do get in touch with us through the website and hopefully the FAQs on the website are helpful to you too. Um, just to kind of sum up really, I wonder if if you all might just say if there's one thing that we haven't talked about or one thing, one really interesting piece of advice that you might give an applicant, is if, if there's anything that you might want to, to leave um, all our wonderful, all the wonderful people who've joined us today, um, anything that you might want to leave them thinking about. I think for me, it's think about the narrative that you put over in the application. What's the story you're trying to convey? what's your what's your direction of travel what have you been doing why the mpp now and where are you going with it in the future and so just really thinking about that story and communicating that to us um just already excited to read it yeah i'd say touching on the question we had about potentially if you're feeling shy if you're not so confident and how to write your application I think really take the time to think about it and try to really sell yourself, sell your application. Um, every year we get so many applicants that um, we can't accept all of the good applicants. Sometimes, unfortunately, we can't give offers to really good applicants. So it's really, how do you meet the criteria that we've been talking about? Um, how would you benefit from the MPP, but what would you also bring to the school? I think really show what makes you, you know, an asset and what would make you a great addition to our cohort. And then, the obvious advice is really look at our application requirements, what documents are required. If there's a list of the documents that you need to submit, you will be asked to submit them. Um, and, you know, the quicker and the, um, the 
better you put your documents together, the better your application will be. So really look at our, um, our requirements and make sure that you meet all of them before submitting your application, I think. Thanks, Richard. I think mine would be ask maybe a mentor or a trusted friend to read through your application. So proof it, print it off. Um, make sure you list all the word counts on every page. We'll obviously be checking your application really clearly, clearly. So if there is something missing or you've forgotten a document, we will um, email you to let you know. And we're here to help. I want to say the team is all here to help you. So if you have any questions at all, please do not be shy. Um, you can email us and we're happy to help. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us. Um, we loved having the opportunity to answer your questions. We hope that's been a really helpful session. Um, and we hope to see all your applications. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye. Bye. <laughs>